For Hype Plus, I'm Tatiana LaJoy. Black people don't go camping, that's for white folks. This opinion may not belong to all black people, but it's a stereotype that is very relevant in our community. However, this stereotype actually rings true since the Outdoor Foundation found that 86% of campers are white. I personally grew up with an adventurous mom who loved to take my siblings and I on trips that included activities like camping, hiking, and skiing. I never thought that it was something out of the norm until I realized that none of my black friends shared the same outdoor experiences. I quickly learned that my family wasn't normal for being so in touch with nature. There was even a moment where I started to resent the outdoor trips because I wanted to fit in with my friends. The reality is there are some black people that love outdoor activities, but it certainly isn't the norm. Like many other stereotypes attached to our community, we don't usually question why they exist, but blindly adhere to them. We don't realize how intergenerational trauma is intertwined in many of these toxic stereotypes. The reason this stereotype is so toxic is because nature is an incredible asset to our lives as human beings. It's intertwined in our community as well as our health and well being mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. Being disconnected from nature is literally like being disconnected from your own DNA. This wasn't the norm back in slave days, so why is it now? Where and when did this disconnection with nature within the black community begin? Here's why black people don't go camping. Critical race theory is an academic concept that is a little over 40 years old and has been an explosive debatable topic recently in grade schools. The controversy stems between liberals arguing that race theory helps develop an understanding of American racism and conservatives that believe it is a discourse that pits minorities against white people. The agenda behind critical race theory is to explain how race in the United States is a social construct embedded in legal systems and policies. An example of this is racial segregation. If you go to Miami's liberal city, for example, you might come across a low wall painted in yellow that was built in the 1930s to divide the white neighborhood from the black neighborhood. There are locals today that don't know the origin of this wall. A 17-year-old interviewer in placesjournal.org said, I was disappointed in myself to have something so historic and important to the black community's culture right here in my own community, and I didn't even know about it. This young man is not alone in his feelings. There are many cities and towns across the country that have segregation and race barriers hidden in plain sight. These barriers were built to divide the races physically and psychologically back then. This segregation not only existed in cities, but also in nature. Back then, camping was an activity that black people were allowed to participate in under the condition that they did not interfere with the white experience. The parks were segregated in a way where black people were limited to a small section of the park and excluded from activities that make camping truly enjoyable, such as hiking or canoeing. Depending on the park, a black family would be denied from these activities entirely or charged an unfair price. Situations like these made camping a white activity since they were afforded the freedom to experience camping in its entirety. On campgrounds, they would have the Negro area for segregated dining rooms, restrooms, cabins, and picnic areas. The areas for blacks were deprioritized and underfunded compared to those for whites. You can still see some examples today in Virginia at Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park in Virginia. The blacks only restroom still remains intact and has bare concrete floor with common tiles on the walls, while the Caucasian restroom was built with polished stone on the floors and walls. There will be some criticism by colored people against segregation, but I think we would be subject to more criticism by the colored people as well as the white people if we put them in with the white people. National Park Service Associate Director, July 26, 1937. The people running the park were fearful that they would get too many complaints from white people, which is why they adhered to the segregation policies. Many national parks received backlash from white people if and when they did support diversity. As an example, an anonymous writer wrote a letter to National Parks magazine stating, if minorities do not like going to the parks, it is their loss, but please don't let us be duped into thinking it is our loss. Many of us look to the parks as an escape from the problems ethnic and minorities create. Please don't modify our parks to destroy our oasis. This letter was received in 1994 with the intent to establish the national parks as a white space. This quote kind of reminds me of when white people tell black people to go back to Africa. Weird thing to say considering your ancestors brought us here. Ironically, white people felt like they needed to escape from the very people that they brought to this country on indigenous land that they stole from people with melanated skin. Critical race theory is important because it helps validate the subliminal and not so subliminal racial injustices that we still experience today. Knowing where these injustices stem from is the first step in making changes that involve more inclusivity. 
Recently, a black woman living in Oregon details her experiences hiking. No one's saying anything, no one's being overtly negative or mean towards you, but just the way that they're staring at you lets you know there's something wrong. You don't belong here. Who are you and why are you here? It's not like they're looking at all strangers that way. They're looking at me and my son that way. In order to access the most beautiful corners of the United States, you must first pass through some of its most racist corners. States most known for their beautiful outdoor areas like Oregon, Montana, and Idaho also report the highest rates of hate crimes. Another caveat that was mentioned in our last story, why black people don't support black people, is how black prosperity is a threat to whites. Even though camping is seen as roughing it, it's actually a pretty expensive activity. To have an enjoyable experience, it can cost a family of four $25,000, give or take, for a weekend trip. 40% of outdoor participants come from households with incomes of $75,000 or more, according to the Outdoor Foundation's report. Camping requires resources such as free time and disposable income that are luxuries more afforded to white people since they have higher average incomes than other races. Camping is a symbol of white wealth and leisure where black participation is seen as a threat. So this, coupled with the history of segregation, has made camping unwelcoming to black people back then and today. Being segregated from outdoor experiences is our history, but does not have to be our future. As far back as the 16th century, German physician Paracelsus said, the art of healing comes from nature, not from the physician. Limited access to nature is what has contributed to many health problems in our community, such as higher levels of mortality, lower levels of physical activity, higher levels of stress, and decreased social capital. Well-known fact, those with darker skin have higher levels of melanin. Lesser known fact, people with high levels of melanin need to spend more time in the sun to produce the same amount of vitamin D as someone with lighter skin. Direct sunlight is essential to melanated people's health because we need vitamin D to absorb calcium and phosphate in our diets. These minerals help support healthy bones, teeth, and muscles. Vitamin D is also important for cell growth and blood sugar regulation. Getting fresh air, especially when living in an urban city, is exponentially beneficial to our health. Fresh air helps our body heal faster, digest food more efficiently, and strengthen the immune system. But even with the knowledge that camping is a beneficial activity, there's still a lot of pushback from our community. The reason being is that many black people have shared the same experience of being made to feel unwelcome in nature and discouraged from enjoying outdoor recreational activities. On the 4th of July, 2020, a black man was almost lynched while camping at Lake Monroe in Indiana to watch the lunar eclipse. The police refused to arrest the five white men accused of this crime. Doing that kind of camping in that part of the South, um, one of the things we also try to do is signal that we are friendly. So my husband, who is a civil rights lawyer, an African-American civil rights lawyer, also has a camping cap, and on his camping cap, Hap is the Confederate flag as a way of kind of signaling, we're friendly, we're here, we're with you in order to make camping safer. A first generation American who expressed how it still resonates, how her family escaped the hard rural life, said the idea of roughing it in a tent, however, can feel to some like going backwards. Another person said, if you find yourself trapped in the middle of the woods without electricity, running water, or a car, you would likely describe that situation as a nightmare or a worst case scenario, like after a plane crash or something. White people refer to that as camping. It's important for us to be aware of our struggles as African Americans in this country. A lot of blacks ask the rhetorical question of why go camping when paying for rent is enough of a challenge? Why are white people more known for being risk takers? Predominantly participating in sports that black people don't typically subscribe to, like skiing, snowboarding, and swimming. One reason is because of the battlegrounds black people endure on a daily basis in their own neighborhoods. We have an inherent defense mechanism to reject anything that could pose a risk to our lives. A lot of black people don't want to go camping because there is no reason to willingly participate in an even riskier situation by being in an unfamiliar environment with wild animals. It took me a while to get into camping. White people did not sell me on what they knew about like the wildlife. Like they said like with grizzly bears, you're supposed to act all big with like the grizzly bears. Yeah. But then what, what, what makes it worse though, they said with the black bears, you run to the nearest lake because the black ones can't swim. <laughs> Comedian Trix explains why black people don't go camping. Why would we want to leave the comfort of our own bed to sleep on the ground in a place where the animals are not afraid of humans? You always have that one guy, come on, bro, you need to experience the wilderness. I'm like, I'm from Africa, I've experienced enough. <laughs> you really think black people would die first in a horror movie situation? No. You want to know why? Here's the secret, people. Black people are pussies. <laughs> 
But all jokes aside, camping is not only good for black people's physical health, but it is also great for our mental health, as it can help you relax and connect with like-minded people. Do you go camping? Let us know if you do or don't in the comments below and why. Stay up to date with the latest news and comedy by subscribing here to our YouTube channel. Follow Comedy Hype across all social media and look out for original content on our new streaming service at ComedyHype.com. For Hype Plus, I'm Tatiana LaJoy.